to another episode of the Design Build Hunt podcast. I'm your host, Josh Raley, and I've got Jake from Whitetail Partners, Michigan, Greg from Whitetail Partners, Ohio, and Sam from Whitetail Partners, Wisconsin on the line. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, Josh. How's it going? How's it going, Josh? Pretty good. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Lee is once again not here, unfortunately. We're going to introduce that rascal at some point. I don't know exactly. Who will be. I know. I know something about being with family this week or I don't know something. I know excuses. We'll let him That's off. right. We'll let them off this time. Yeah. Yeah. I heard, I heard there was a beach involved, so I guess, uh, I guess we'll have to let have it to slide let this off. time. Yeah. This time, this time sounds like it was for a good cause. So uh, guys up for discussion today. One of the things that sets us apart as whitetail partners is our regional approach. Um, there are lots of different uh, brands or maybe habitat managers out there who obviously have a regional approach because they're based in one specific location, but they're lacking. Uh, Sam and I have talked about this in a previous episode, maybe a little bit of a national perspective, or there may be some larger ones out there that kind of have a national perspective, but not a lot of individuals on the ground. You know, they cover all kinds of areas, but they're, they're not necessarily from a specific area. That's kind of their bread and butter. Here with Whitetail Partners, we do things a little bit different. We have a national approach, namely, uh, there are five of us spread across the eastern half of the United States. Um, You know, we all serve kind of our own state and surrounding areas. But then, um, you know, we we also have we're also we're also professionals right here in our own backyard. And so, uh, Sam, I want to kick things off by coming to you and saying, what is it about uh, whitetail habitat design, property design that made you want to move towards a Nat or a, a, a state specific or regional sp- specific approach, as opposed to, you know, just trying to be Sam Billhorn flying all over the place. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, and I did that, uh, that was the start was my, my, you know, myself going all over the place and, uh, hitting, I think at, at, uh, my top, my top end was 14 different States, uh, doing uh, whitetail design in, and, you know, throughout that process, there are so many things that are consistent. It's a, obviously it's the same animal, right? And they do a lot of similar things, but you know, there are so many aspects to that. And many of which that I, I learned along the way was, you know, some things like not just uh, habitat, which is tremendously different, obviously terrain um, and also soils and what can grow and, you know, the products that are used in one area are not going to be used in another but also culturally, there's so many differences of, you know, when the seasons are in in corresponding from archery, firearms, and, you know, when in each state, you know, that, and that varies from state to state, not just region. And, you know, I found myself studying a lot of those things because if you can use a rifle during the rut, you have obviously a distinct advantage and might do things differently and even set up a farm differently than if you were uh, doing that with archery as it is in many states. So uh, knowing that local knowledge. So I think it's, I looked at this and when we, we came together as a team, we all look at it this way is that we can have a uh, similar approach and logic and process and products and all these things that we're delivering to our clients as far as the highest quality plans and what we're going through to make sure we don't miss anything but combine that with the local experience local knowledge of all those things and yeah right now we're titled as states just to let people know where our home base is but each of us serves in multiple areas more like regions and uh, it's through that that we can be really dialed in we know so much better the uh, all the things i've mentioned um, as well as just getting to know and network, you know, as we get into land management, as we get into um, real estate and some of these other things to network and know best uh, locally what's available, connecting our clients and, and really uh, having deeper roots within those areas. Uh, that was the opportunity we, we look to capture is bringing great process, uh, having this brand that covers, you know, the entire Whitetails range 
but then having local experience, local knowledge uh, to help our clients on an individual uh, customized basis. Yeah, that's really, really good. I, I wonder if you could kick off the next part of our conversation uh, by answering this question. What is it about maybe Wisconsin that's going to be unique within the country? Why, why don't you want a habitat specialist from Kentucky, you know, mm -hmm. helping you out with your property in, in Wisconsin? What, what gives you as a Wisconsin native the leg up there? Sure. Well, and as I mentioned before, knowing all those critical things of when the hunting seasons are and the details of how, how different pressure impacts uh, at different times of the year and all those things. But Wisconsin is a tough state to begin with. I mean, as far as different ecoregions go and how we're set up, and I've posted about this just explaining, like, we have an enormous amount of diversity within our state. And uh, to be an expert here, uh, for someone to know all of those different regions, you know, these various ecoregions within our state and those details is very difficult. Um, and I've seen properties that have very, and I, uh, just an example, simple example, topography. Some properties that have a variation over 40 acres of about four feet, they're wet, low-lying parcels. They're, they're yeah, on the paper, they're flat. You know, what do you do with that? But then also go into uh, uh, hill country and we might have 200, maybe 300 feet of eleva elevation change just over 40. And, and I think that that's, you know, seeing that uh, diversity within, combining that with a lot of different uh, um, agricultural regions and, and how things are done on, uh, on the agricultural side. You know, there's a lot of different details to know and things to pick up on. So I look at it and say, I've seen, you know, I don't know, it's probably about close to 100 properties within the state here now of how different they can all be. And for somebody to have that uh, kind of uh, diversity or, and have that uh, ability to pick up on all those things, uh, coming in. I really think there's details uh, they'd be missing out on. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I, I like to pick on my my northern brothers here about just a little bit, is just how different the timing can be, right? You, you kind of alluded to that. But uh, so for our South Alabama property, we're going down in two weeks to plant our food plots for the year. Uh, so we're right there at the end of October. That's when we'll be putting our food plots in. Uh, our rut's not till February, though. So we've got plenty of time, you know, no worries. We've got plenty of time to get the deer uh, into the fields, but uh, just very, very different. So Jake, there in Michigan, obviously Michigan has a very strong hunting culture, just like Wisconsin does, but there are some things that make it different, make it unique. What are some of the unique challenges or maybe uh, unique aspects for whitetail habitat design that are that are just different for, for folks in Michigan? Right. And when I started doing this, like my, my base was uh, with habitat improvement, like on, on a property. And just just with improving the habitat on your property, that's going to be different in different parts of Michigan. So just for example, like in, in northern Michigan with soil types, it'll be a lot sandier. Or if you get closer to the west coast of Michigan, a lot sandier than uh, southeastern Michigan. Much better soils down there. So you might be able to... Uh, plant, you know, different things or, or rec recommend different plantings, different screening options, you know, depending on what part of the state you're in. And also the, the tree species, they, I mean, they're largely the same throughout the state, but you're going to have concentrations of different tree species, you know, in, in different parts of the state. And so that's why I think it's important to find someone who knows the area, because if, if I went down to Georgia to do a property, you know, I, there's going to be questions that are asked, like, you know, what is this plant? And I, you know, I, I could probably figure it out, but it's going to take me a lot longer than, you know, in Michigan, I could, you know, tell them what it is without leaves on it. You know, I just, okay, yeah, that's a sassafras tree, you know, or, or, you know, this is this. And I, I know that, you know, based on, you know, prior experiences that, you know, different, different types of trees and, and different plant life are more preferred by, by deer than others. You know, if, if they're browsing on conifers in your property, then, you know, you're, you're lacking uh, quality food. But it's like if you, and also like if you have a lot of uh, red maples, those are pretty good to just flush cut them because they're going to really uh, sprout from the stump. And that's a, that's a really good source of nutrition for the, the local deer herd. But like if you are not from the area or maybe you, there's, you know, tree species or plant species that you're not familiar with, you know, that's a disadvantage to the landowner that you're not 
uh, providing him with that information. So having someone local that knows these things it is a huge advantage. And uh, you touched on it as well, uh, just the different cultures. And here in Michigan, there's a, a, a very strong hunting culture. And I mean, they're, they're every, like Wisconsin has a great hunting culture. Ohio has a great hunting culture. Uh, you know, M- Michigan has one too, but it's, it's different. Uh, we, we don't have the, a lot of times the restraint here in Michigan, the landowners don't have the restraint to, to let that, uh, not even like the two and a half year old buck go, but just the year and a half old buck go. And so you have to go into the property knowing that depending on how many landowners are surrounding your, your client, you know, you might need to set that property up a little bit differently. You know, how are we going to try to encourage these deer to move through the property? Like, do we, like the neighbor has a big ag field that all these deer want to get to. How can we slow these deer down? So hopefully they can most nights get there after dark because that guy has a box blind right on the property line. And we want to make sure that he doesn't have as many opportunities, you know, uh, you know, just, just trying to make sure that your deer can survive a, a little longer, you know, than maybe the neighbor's property. And because right. we have kind of like that uh, more aggressive hunting culture with, with uh, I guess, targeting a lot of different uh, or, or targeting younger deer, younger bucks, these deer are really pressured. Like the, these bucks feel pressure at a younger age. So, I, you know, I, I've hunted deer in, in different states and in, I, don't, I hunt mostly in Michigan, but I will say in my, my experience, bucks act a little bit different here they just they're a little bit more the, the like older bucks are always skittish they're always weary but i feel like that gets ingrained on them at a younger age here in michigan and so you have to kind of set up your properties a little bit differently so where you see sometimes in uh, those uh you know the premier hunting states maybe iowa kansas you see a redneck blind in the middle of a food plot hunters are walking through the middle of food plot climb up in their redneck blind and then their their trophy walks out you know, an hour and a half later and they shoot them, you know, that, that would never happen here. You know, you have to be a lot more careful when you're setting up a, an ambush location here in Michigan. So that you just have to take, you know, so a consultant that might be from one of those states coming into Michigan and applying those strategies, they, they would not work uh, nearly as often as if you were, there's a lot more detail has to go into the plans here to, to ensure success or, you know, higher probability of success. Right. Right. Yeah. That's really good. And you guys, you have what, a, a two week rifle season or a two week gun season. So yeah, it starts November 15th and it, and it goes for about two weeks. And d- depending on the year, uh, there, there's also another, there's a muzzle loader season in like early December. And depending, depending on the year, sometimes you can use any legal firearm during the, the muzzle loader season. So there's sometimes there's a, there's a third week during that kind of second peak in breeding man i'm sure that's i'm sure a lot of a lot of good bucks fall during that time frame yeah yeah it really that you can even tell on the cameras that just the the amount of stress that goes through the entire deer herd uh, we we try to you know keep our core of our property uh we just leave it alone let, give the deer a place to hide out so when the when the all the pressure when the orange army comes out you know they the deer have a place to hide but even with giving the deer a place to hide you know we hunt 70 acres and, you know, we try to leave a lot of that to the deer. E- even with doing that, you can tell just based on the camera, the cell cams, that movement shuts down on the 15th. So no, it's a completely different uh, game after the uh, morning of the, the 15th. Right, right. Jay, or uh, Greg, sorry. So I know you've got uh, you've got something a little unique going on there that we've got going on for us here in, uh, in Georgia as well that definitely influences the way that we that we design we've we've joked about comparing the price of a year's worth of corn to the price of a habitat design and what that what that would look like but uh, why don't you go into a little bit about ohio and the areas that you serve and what makes them you know unique yeah uh you know touching on that corn piece it's it's something that people use throughout the state of ohio and it it's hard to sit back and hate on them for it because it just, it flat out works for them. Um, and guys are just willing to do it, man. You know, they'll go out there and they'll fill these feeders up and they'll have it be a year round thing. And it leads to them having success. And, you know, the saying of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if your goal every year is to, to get a new wall hanger buck, then, 
I mean, if, if their strategy works, why, why switch it up? Right. Um, but my goal is to kind of bring in, you know, more of the natural use of the land. How are deer using the landscape? Um, I'm personally drawn to the eastern down to the southern part of Ohio and then funneling over into like the Appalachia region. Uh, I really like the mountainous terrain. It's something that I've always been drawn to and it's something that I feel is unique, the, the Appalachia region itself, just because of the way the landscape lays out there's already only so many options for how the deer can use the property. When you start to pair that with habitat improvements and you really start to piece it together and you can understand why bucks are going to travel, say, on this travel corridor below a hilltop bedding area. And you can bring in wind and thermals and everything like that into already condensed down movement based off of the terrain, you can really improve your odds for some really good opportunities. Um, just simply being, you can get into some of these properties in the southeast part of Ohio, particularly that it might be a hundred acres, but out of that hundred acres, the only plausible place for deer to use, they might only be using 60 acres of that hundred. And then out of that 60 acres, how much do you want to quote unquote give to the deer? And how many of those acres do you want to use for yourself? So big pieces can get small really quick if you want to, in my eyes, lay it out properly. But Using the terrain to benefit these habitat plans is probably my favorite piece uh, just because I've learned so much from just going out and observing deer in like the big national forest, state forest ground in the southern part of the state of how they use these different terrain features and work through the landscape. And it's just a really special thing when you can start to pair that with these different habitat projects. And I just, I think that is unique to the Appalachia region because there's just not much like it throughout the rest of the whitetails range in my experience but then that kind of leads into why we have this regional approach is that i understand how the deer work through this landscape but there may be other parts of the whitetails range that i'm unfamiliar with that are actually very similar to this but i found a pretty good comfort zone in this steep rugged terrain and i just i also think it's something that people aren't willing to tackle the project just because it takes a lot. Um, it takes a lot of physical effort. It takes a lot of mental effort to put together a solid plan in the mountain region. But man, the, the rewards that come from it are special because they're, in my mind, there's nothing that beats a big old mountain buck. Um, those are, those are some old cagey creatures that they tell folklores about for years and years. And I just love, love something about it. <laughs> right. Right. So I think we've got some similarities here. Uh, there in the mountains, you've got uh, you've got the mountain laurel and rhododendron in that southern portion of Ohio, right? Yeah, it starts to you got to get uh, to get like the rhododendron. What I've seen anyway is like more so when you start to cross over into West Virginia and eastern Kentucky uh, down in that range. But we do get a lot of the mountain laurel. Um, we see that all over the place. Right, and that stuff, hmm. man, it's it's thick. Yeah, uh, and it can be, it it can create this weird dome. But uh, if you haven't messed with it much before you know people talk a lot about how it provides good deer cover and it and it really really can but there's almost no browse value or no value outside of of just being cover yeah. and if it's not managed correctly it can look like open timber from you know five foot and down it's nothing but stems you know so it looks just like this dome that the that the deer have to to walk up inside of and live in there but um, not much going for them outside of that, but you know, one thing you touched on there is, is the baiting piece. And I, I kind of teed you up for that one because, uh, I wanted somebody to broach the topic before <laughs> me. Um, I, I, you know, everybody is, is free to do what they want to do. I'll never discourage someone from, from doing something that's legal and, and something that's been working for, for them. But what I have found working with individuals here in Georgia, you know, we, we, we do a lot of baiting here in Georgia and the concern is always, Hey, you know, my neighbors are all baiting and therefore I have to bait too, to be able to compete. And the assumption behind that is, is that a corn pile beats everything in the whitetails world. A corn pile is the number one, most important thing is what that's really saying. When you say, if my neighbors do it, I have to do it too. 
But what we're seeing is that there are a lot of things that beat a corn pile, such as consistent food plots that have something in them pretty much year round for the deer, uh, such as good cover that beats the cover on the surrounding properties, such as low impact uh, on your property that beats corn piles all day long. I'm curious in your experience, Greg, how fast are you seeing bucks adjust when that pressure really starts to hit and start to act differently around those corn piles? Because in my experience, it doesn't take long. Yeah, I think it's pretty quick. Um, I, I think the, the reason being is that it's so not easy physically or easy as in the terms of it because it, it costs it's an investment to run these feeders the way you need to in order to hold the deer in your area um, but a lot of people can do it simply if they're willing to make that investment and fill up the feeder and those people at least some of them aren't going to take the time to start to understand why it is deer are doing what they're doing and why they're navigating the landscape the way they are and they're ignoring things like wind direction. They're ignoring things like stand access. And they're doing things so wrong that it's just like that immediate like, oh, I'm not supposed to be here for the deer. And then they completely adjust their strategies. So instead of using that mindset of, well, my neighbor's doing it, so I need to have a corn feeder as well. In my mind, it says, how can we use that corn feeder to our advantage? What can we give our property that his does not have to give us a higher likelihood? And like you said, offering better browse material, but now if you can anticipate that guy coming in there, pressuring that corn pile, now they're gonna be looking for a sanctuary. So if you can either provide that sanctuary or you can kind of intersect that travel that would be going to the corn, you can do so many different strategies to put yourself in such a better position to harvest these bucks than if you were to just consistently sit over that corn pile. The beautiful thing, beautiful thing about it is, is that these corn piles are usually annual things. A lot of guys have feeders on them and it doesn't take a rocket scientist looking at a satellite image to see a corn feeder when you're at the zoomed in version. Like you can see it, it's going to be in the same spot. It's usually in an open area. So you can really start to craft your habitat plan around that. And I just look at it like that's just something that we have to deal with. And instead of trying to compete with it, let's just find a way to make what we have better. And then in the long run, it's just going to make our setup better. Right, right. And they, to me, uh, you know, here in Georgia, it's a, it's a pretty unique state, right? So we've got the mountains in the north. You've got the Piedmont region right across the center. You get to southern Georgia, heavy ag country. That's where our real big bucks are. That's where our you know, if you just go look at the Boone and Crockett or the Pope and Young records, like South Georgia, especially Southwest Georgia is where, where the big deer are. And there's a good reason for that. Peanuts and soybeans. Like that's where we grow our peanuts. That's where we grow our soybeans. Um, but one thing is consistent from North to South, everybody likes to put out corn feeders. And like I said, I will, I will never tell someone that it's wrong to, to put out a corn feeder, but I have never seen, uh, or I don't think there is any other, um, tool in the hunting arsenal that can have a negative impact on deer behavior like a corn pile can. Um, here in our yard, we've got deer in the yard. I'll occasionally put out some corn so the kids can watch them. So this week the kids are on fall break. So you, I've got a corn pile out there in the backyard so that the kids can stay up and watch them, you know, right before dark. And we watched a buck fawn the other evening. Um, you know, season's been in here for a couple of weeks now. We started September 9th. So we're, you know, a month into the season. They, the deer were coming in regularly. They'd just walk straight out of the clear cut or the, the power line behind our house, straight to the corn pile, all start eating. It's great. Well, now, all of a sudden, uh, we watched a buck fawn the other evening, and he took 20 minutes to work his way from the edge of the wood line over to the corn pile. Smelling, looking around, smelling, looking around, take a couple of steps. What happened? Well, he had a negative experience, not at our corn pile. We don't hunt the deer here. We just watch them. They're fun to watch out the window, but he's had a negative experience as a buck fawn, you know, at a corn pile and it's impacted the way he approaches that kind of a food source now. So we can oftentimes be doing more harm than good thinking, oh, I need this because my neighbors have it. It's like, you might be better off just avoiding that altogether because of how it's going to change the deer behavior. But, um, you know, just speaking quickly about Georgia and what makes Georgia unique, um, you know, in our regional approach, 
one of the things is much like Wisconsin and much like you guys have talked about with your states, um, you know, it is very different from one end to the other. And there's a lot of different eco regions. One of the things that we have to deal with here, I don't know how much of it you guys have to deal with, um, is pine plantations and pine leases. We get a lot of that here. A lot of the hunting properties um, that people have here are not owned hunting properties. They're leased land. They're large leases too. You may have a thousand acres, 1500 acres. Uh, I'm on a lease here that's just over 2000 acres and it's a great property to hunt. The problem is sometimes there are limitations to what you can do. And so we've, we've got to get really creative. Number one, with how we're designing. Uh, number two, with what we're planting and where. And number three, we've really got to work very, very closely with our foresters about how these woods are managed, uh, not just from a timber value perspective, because that's that's their top priority, right? Is timber value, making sure maximum profit comes off of that land. That's all fine and good, but we've got to get them on the phone sometimes to say, hey, what can we do to not impact that profit, but, but will also benefit our wildlife? Like, hey, I know you'd love to come in and you would love to clear cut, you know, this whole 300 acre swath. And sometimes they do that, but is there any way you can clear cut half of it and come back in a couple of years and get the rest? You know, is there any way we can start to stagger this or checkerboard a property? Is there any way you can burn, you know, this 50 acres this year for us? We know, you know, you're on a four year burn rotation because that's what works out well for, uh, for, for your pine, pine trees. But boy, it would really be helpful if you can get these burns on a two-year rotation. Can we help? Can we burn? Can we participate in the management of these pines so that we can maximize the benefit for wildlife on the ground? And so, you know, I don't know how much of that you guys have to deal with, but I know that is a, a particularly uh, strong need here is making sure that we're keeping an eye on um, maximizing value Essentially, um, you know, messing with the pine trees here would be like telling a farmer in Wisconsin, hey, you can't plant corn here for the next 30 years. Uh, you know, we're going to that, that's the kind of impact it would have because these are 30 year crops. These aren't, you know, single year crops. So these are 30 year crops. There's a lot of money invested in them. We've got to be very, very careful with how we uh, how we address that. So, uh, guys, I think the regional approach is is one of the, the I think, greatest strong suits that we bring. Tell me a little bit about when it comes to the regional approach, what are some of the things that get you most excited when you start to learn from guys in other regions? So I think not only is our approach strong because we've got Greg in Ohio and Jake in Michigan and Lee in Tennessee and Sam in Wisconsin, but it's also great because we get to come together and do stuff like this and learn from each other. So uh, maybe talk a little bit about what we can learn from each other, what we can pick up and how things may differ and make us better. Yeah, I'll jump on that, Josh. And just to say, you know, we talk about how things are different and how we need to know that. But to the back to the original point that of how things are consistent and we can pick up and learn pieces from each other and implement those in a way, you know, interpret that for our region, for our condition, for our client in a way that it is another tool in our toolbox. We're constantly picking things up. You may, you know, some of these things, if you if you study what what uh, topics are, what people are doing in different places, you know, they things catch on here and then they pop up over there. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how different tactics move over time. And especially if you combine all the, di the variations of a season, when the ruts hit, all these things that you've described, how they're very different across the country, but we can, we can take that thing that's done differently somewhere else and maybe there's a way that it can be implemented by us uh, where, wherever that application is. And I'm looking forward to that camaraderie we're going to have here. And really, that's going to benefit the listeners, I think, as well to, to understand, OK, that's going on there now in Michigan. And I might be able to apply that down here in Alabama, um, you know, a few months down the line and vice versa. Yeah, that's really, really good. Others? No, and I was just going to say, like, I'm excited to continue to learn myself. And it, I have learned a lot from both uh, Sam and Greg. So, like, for me in Michigan, most of the properties that I'm on are fairly flat. Like, there's elevation change, but not like the properties that Greg is visiting or, or not like Sam's properties that he's visiting in Wisconsin. And so if ever there's a time where I have to 
you know, I, I do get a, a property here in Michigan. There are some areas with, with significant elevation change. You know, I, I might reach out to these guys just to kind of brainstorm a little bit prior to just to, to see like, hey, this is what I'm thinking or you know, what would you uh, do in, in this scenario here just to make sure that we're giving the client, you know, the best possible design. That's one thing that's very unique about, I guess, our approach of doing things is we can bounce ideas off each other where if we might not see something as often as, as someone else, you know, we can reach out to the other, the other partners and, and kind of, you know, collaborate with them just to try to put together a, a solution for the client. And so that, that's something that a lot of guys or a lot of other consultants, I don't think they ha they have that uh, available to them. So they, they'd have to go in there and, and figure it out themselves. Right. Right. Yeah. That's that we can all learn from that. I, I will say, you know, for Hill country, man, I was on a property with Sam at one point and I followed him down into a bottom and I regretted it. By the time we, by the time we got back out on the top, I was like, Holy cow, Sam, I don't know where you just took me down into, but I'm not sure you're not going to have to go get a side by side and get me out of this thing. Yeah. I, I was chuckling because uh, thinking about that situation too, but the, you know, the topography variation is a great example. And what back to what Jake was saying about um, uh, conferring about plans you know, one of the things we have behind the scenes uh, that we get to have the benefit of is all this plan sharing. You know, as we're as we're working together as a team, obviously we're sharing our concepts, ideas, vetting plans together, all those things. But we also have uh, a library that's growing exponentially uh, with plans that we can look to different ideas and different approaches. Uh, maybe go back and consult something that's a situation that is unique to a property that may have happened somewhere else for somebody. And we can look to those things and, and learn from our experiences through studying those designs. Right. Yeah. And we'll have, you know, years of test cases with, you know, everybody in different regions of the country, figuring out what worked in this kind of scenario, what maybe didn't, what did we need to come back the second year and tweak on the plan? Or was there anything that we needed to tweak on the plan? So uh, very, very good guys. Well, this I think is going to wrap up this conversation about, uh, the regional approach of of Whitetail Partners. Hey, guys, if you're looking to get a hold of us, you can find us at whitetailpartners.com. You can find us on Facebook, Whitetail Partners LLC, or you can find us on Instagram at Whitetail Partners. Greg, are we on TikTok yet? Are we, have we gotten Sam to do any of the dances yet? Oh, no dances yet. Uh, we are starting to put on some of the YouTube shorts and in addition to our long form videos, uh, but no, we have not have hopped All on right. any of the dancing trends quite yet. All right. Well, when we get Sam doing that, guys, we'll be on TikTok. But until next time, uh, we'll catch you later.